The Lost Symbol Novel by Dan Brown Chapter 6 Is this as close as you can get? Robert Langdon felt a sudden wave of anxiety as his driver parked on First Street a good quarter mile from the Capitol building. Afraid so, the driver said. Homeland Security No vehicles near landmark buildings anymore. I'm sorry, sir. Langdon checked his watch, startled to see it was already 6.50. A construction zone around the National Mall had slowed them down and his lecture was to begin in 10 minutes. Weather's turning, the driver said, hopping out and opening Langdon's door for him. You'll want to hurry. Langdon reached for his wallet to tip the driver, but the man waved him off. Your host already added a very generous tip to the charge. Typical Peter, Langdon thought, gathering his things. Okay, thanks for the ride. The first few raindrops began to fall as Langdon reached the top of the gracefully arched concourse that descended to the new, underground, visitor's entrance. The Capitol Visitor Center had been a costly and controversial project. Described as an underground city to rival parts of Disney World, this subterranean space reportedly provided over a half million square feet of space for exhibits, restaurants, and meeting halls. Langdon had been looking forward to seeing it, although he hadn't anticipated quite this long a walk. The skies were threatening to open at any moment, and he broke into a jug, his loafers offering almost no traction on the wet cement. I dressed for a lecture, not a 400-yard downhill dash through the rain. When he arrived at the bottom, he was breathless and panting. Langdon pushed through the revolving door, taking a moment in the foyer to catch his breath and brush off the rain. As he did, he raised his eyes to the newly completed space before him. Okay, I'm impressed. The Capitol Visitor Center was not at all what he had expected. Because the space was underground, Langdon had been apprehensive about passing through it. A childhood accident had left him stranded at the bottom of a deep well overnight, and Langdon now lived with an almost crippling aversion to enclosed spaces. But this underground space was airy somehow. Light. Spacious. The ceiling was a vast expanse of glass with a series of dramatic light fixtures that threw a muted glow across the pearl-colored interior finishes. Normally, Langdon would have taken a full hour in here to admire the architecture, but with five minutes until showtime, he put his head down and dashed through the main hall toward the security checkpoint and escalators. Relax, he told himself. Peter knows you're on your way. The event won't start without you. At the security point, a young Hispanic guard chatted with him while Langdon emptied his pockets and removed his vintage watch. Mickey Mouse, the guard said, sounding mildly amused. Langdon nodded, accustomed to the comments. The collector's edition Mickey Mouse watch had been a gift from his parents on his ninth birthday. I wear it to remind me to slow down and take life less seriously. I don't think it's working, the guard said with a smile. You look like you're in a serious hurry. Langdon smiled and put his day back through the x-ray machine. Which way to the statuary hall? The guard motioned toward the escalators. You'll see the signs. Thanks. Langdon grabbed his bag off the conveyor and hurried on. As the escalator ascended, Langdon took a deep breath and tried to gather his thoughts. He gazed up through the rain-speckled glass ceiling at the mountainous form of the illuminated Capitol Dome overhead. It was an astonishing building. High atop her roof, almost 300 feet in the air, the Statue of Freedom peered out into the misty darkness like a ghostly sentinel. Langdon always found it ironic that the workers who hoisted each piece of the 19 and a half foot bronze statue to her perch were slaves a capitol secret that seldom made the syllabi of high school history classes. This entire building, in fact, 
was a treasure trove of bizarre arcana that included a killer bathtub responsible for the pneumonic murder of Vice President Henry Wilson, a staircase with a permanent blood stain over which an inordinate number of guests seemed to trip, and a sealed basement chamber in which workers in 1930 discovered General John Alexander Logan's long-diseased stuffed horse. No legends were as enduring, however, as the claims of 13 different ghosts that haunted this building. The spirit of city designer Pierre L. Enfant frequently was reported wandering the halls, seeking payment of his bill, now 200 years overdue. The ghost of a worker who fell from the Capitol Dome during construction was seen wandering the corridors with a tray of tools. And, of course, the most famous apparition of all, reported numerous times in the Capitol basement an ephemeral black cat that prowled the substructure's airy maze of narrow passageways and cubicles. Langdon stepped off the escalator and again checked his watch. Three minutes. He hurried down the wide corridor, following the signs toward the statuary hall and rehearsing his opening remarks in his head. Langdon had to admit that Peter's assistant had been correct. This lecture topic would be a perfect match for an event hosted in Washington, D.C., by a prominent Mason. It was no secret that D.C. had a rich Masonic history. The cornerstone of this very building had been laid in a full Masonic ritual by George Washington himself. This city had been conceived and designed by Master Masons George Washington, Ben Franklin, and Pierre L. Enfant powerful minds who adorned their new capital with Masonic symbolism, architecture, and art. Of course, people see in those symbols all kinds of crazy ideas. Many conspiracy theorists claim the Masonic forefathers had concealed powerful secrets throughout Washington along with symbolic messages hidden in the city's layout of streets. Langdon never paid any attention. Misinformation about the Masons was so commonplace that even educated Harvard students seemed to have surprisingly warped conceptions about the Brotherhood. Last year, a freshman had rushed wild-eyed into Langdon's classroom with a printout from the web. It was a street map of DC on which certain streets had been highlighted to form various shapes satanic pentacles, a Masonic compass and square, the head of Baphomet proof apparently that the Masons who designed Washington, D.C., were involved in some kind of dark, mystical conspiracy. Fun, Langdon said, but hardly convincing. If you draw enough intersecting lines on a map, you're bound to find all kinds of shapes. But this can't be coincidence, the kid exclaimed. Langdon patiently showed the student that the same exact shapes could be formed on a street map of Detroit. The kid seemed sorely disappointed. Don't be disheartened, Langdon said. Washington does have some incredible secrets. Just none on this street map. The young man perked up. Secrets? Like what? Every spring, I teach a course called Occult Symbols. I talk a lot about DC. You should take the course. Occult symbols. The freshman looked excited again. So there are devil symbols in DC. Langdon smiled. Sorry, but the word occult, despite conjuring images of devil worship, actually means hidden or obscured. In times of religious oppression, Knowledge that was counter-doctrinal had to be kept hidden or occult, and because the church felt threatened by this, they redefined anything occult as evil, and the prejudice survived. Oh! The kid slumped. Nonetheless, that spring, Langdon spotted the freshmen seated in the front row as 500 students bustled into Harvard Sanders Theatre, a hollow old lecture hall with creaking wooden benches. Good morning, everybody, Langdon shouted from the expansive stage. He turned on a slide projector, and an image materialized behind him. As you're getting settled, how many of you recognize the building in this picture? U.S. Capitol, dozens of voices called out in unison. Washington, D.C. Yes. 
There are 9 million pounds of ironwork in that dome. An unparalleled feat of architectural ingenuity for the 1850s. Awesome, somebody shouted. Langdon rolled his eyes, wishing somebody would ban that word. Okay, and how many of you have ever been to Washington? A scattering of hands went up. So few. Langdon feigned surprise. And how many of you have been to Rome, Paris, Madrid, or London? Almost all the hands in the room went up. As usual. One of the rites of passage for American college kids was a summer with a Eurorail ticket before the harsh reality of real life set in. It appears many more of you have visited Europe than have visited your own capital. Why do you think that is? No drinking age in Europe, someone in back shouted. Langdon smiled. As if the drinking age here stops any of you. Everyone laughed. It was the first day of school and the students were taking longer than usual to get settled, shifting and creaking in their wooden pews. Langdon loved teaching in this hall because he always knew how engaged the students were simply by listening to how much they fidgeted in their pews. Seriously, Langdon said, Washington, D.C. has some of the world's finest architecture, art, and symbolism. Why would you go overseas before visiting your own capital? Ancient stuff is cooler, someone said. And by ancient stuff, Langdon clarified, I assume you mean castles, crypts, temples, that sort of thing. Their heads nodded in unison. Okay. Now, what if I told you that Washington, D.C. has every one of those things? Castles, crypts, pyramids, temples. It's all there. The creaking diminished. My friends, Langdon said, lowering his voice and moving to the front of the stage, in the next hour, you will discover that our nation is overflowing with secrets and hidden history. And exactly as in Europe, all of the best secrets are hidden in plain view. The wooden pews fell dead silent. Gotcha! Langdon dimmed the lights and called up his second slide. Who can tell me what George Washington is doing here? The slide was a famous mural depicting George Washington dressed in full Masonic regalia standing before an odd-looking contraption a giant wooden tripod that supported a rope and pulley system from which was suspended a massive block of stone. A group of well-dressed onlookers stood around him. Lifting that big block of stone, someone ventured. Langdon said nothing, preferring that a student make the correction if possible. Actually. Another student offered, I think Washington is lowering the rock. He's wearing a masonic costume. I've seen pictures of masons laying cornerstones before. The ceremony always uses that tripod thing to lower the first stone. Excellent, Langdon said. The mural portrays the father of our country using a tripod and pulley to lay the cornerstone of our Capitol building on 18 September 1793 between the hours of 11.15 and 12.30. Langdon paused, scanning the class. Can anyone tell me the significance of that date and time? Silence. What if I told you that precise moment was chosen by three famous Masons George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Pierre L. Enfant, the primary architect for D.C.? More silence. Quite simply, the cornerstone was set at that date and time because, among other things, the auspicious Caput Draconis was in Virgo. Everyone exchanged odd looks. Hold on, someone said. You mean? Like astrology? Exactly. Although a different astrology than we know today. A hand went up. You mean our founding fathers believed in astrology? Langdon grinned. Big time. What would you say if I told you the city of Washington, D.C., has more astrological signs in its architecture than any other city in the world's zodiacs, star charts, cornerstones laid at precise astrological dates and times? 
more than half of the framers of our constitution were masons men who strongly believed that the stars and fate were intertwined men who paid close attention to the layout of the heavens as they structured their new world but that whole thing about the capitol cornerstone being laid while caput draconis was in virgo who cares can't that just be coincidence an impressive coincidence considering that the cornerstones of the three structures that make up federal triangle the capitol the white house the washington monument were all laid in different years but were carefully timed to occur under this exact same astrological condition langdon's gaze was met by a room full of wide eyes a number of heads dipped down as students began taking notes a hand and back went up why did they do that langdon chuckled the answer to that is an entire semester's worth of material if you're curious you should take my mysticism course frankly i don't think you guys are emotionally prepared to hear the answer what the person shouted try us langdon made a show of considering it and then shook his head toying with them sorry i can't do that some of you are only freshmen i'm afraid it might blow your minds tell us everyone shouted langdon shrugged perhaps you should join the masons or eastern star and learn about it from the source we can't get in a young man argued the masons are like a super secret society super secret really langdon remembered the large masonic ring that his friend peter salomon wore proudly on his right hand then why do masons wear obvious masonic rings tie clips or pins why are masonic buildings clearly marked why are there meeting times in the newspaper langdon smiled at all the puzzled faces my friends the masons are not a secret society they are a society with secrets same thing someone muttered is it langdon challenged would you consider coca cola a secret society of course not the student said well what if you knocked on the door of corporate headquarters and asked for the recipe for classic coke they'd never tell you exactly in order to learn coca cola's deepest secret you would need to join the company work for many years prove you were trustworthy and eventually rise to the upper echelons of the company where that information might be shared with you then you would be sworn to secrecy so you're saying freemasonry is like a corporation only in so far as they have a strict hierarchy and they take secrecy very seriously my uncle is a mason a young woman piped up and my aunt hates it because he won't talk about it with her she says masonry is some kind of strange religion a common misperception it's not a religion give it the litmus test langdon said who here has taken professor witherspoon's comparative religion course several hands went up good so tell me what are the three prerequisites for an ideology to be considered a religion abc one woman offered assure believe convert correct langdon said religions assure salvation religions believe in a precise theology and religions convert non-believers he paused masonry however is batting zero for three masons make no promises of salvation and they have no specific theology and they do not seek to convert you in fact within masonic lodges discussions of religion are prohibited so masonry is anti-religious on the contrary one of the prerequisites for becoming a mason is that you must believe in a higher power the difference between masonic spirituality and organized religion is that the masons do not impose a specific definition or name on a higher power rather than definitive theological identities like god allah buddha or jesus the masons use more general terms like supreme being or great architect of the universe 
This enables masons of different faiths to gather together. Sounds a little far out, someone said. Or, perhaps, refreshingly open-minded. Langdon offered. In this age when different cultures are killing each other over whose definition of God is better, one could say the Masonic tradition of tolerance and open-mindedness is commendable. Langdon paced the stage. Moreover, Masonry is open to men of all races, colors, and creeds, and provides a spiritual fraternity that does not discriminate in any way. Doesn't discriminate. A member of the university's women's center stood up. How many women are permitted to be Masons, Professor Langdon? Langdon showed his palms in surrender. A fair point. Freemasonry had its roots, traditionally, in the stone masons' guilds of Europe and was therefore a man's organization. Several hundred years ago, some say as early as 1703, a women's branch called Eastern Star was founded. They have more than a million members. Nonetheless, the woman said, Masonry is a powerful organization from which women are excluded. Langdon was not sure how powerful the Masons really were anymore, and he was not going to go down that road. Perceptions of the modern Masons ranged from there being a group of harmless old men who liked to play dress up. All the way to an underground cabal of power brokers who ran the world. The truth, no doubt, was somewhere in the middle. Professor Langdon, Called a young man with curly hair in the back row, if masonry is not a secret society, not a corporation, and not a religion, then what is it? Well, if you were to ask a mason, he would offer the following definition, masonry is a system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. Sounds to me like a euphemism for freaky cult. Freaky, you say? Hell yes. The kid said, standing up. I heard what they do inside those secret buildings. Weird candlelight rituals with coffins and nooses and drinking wine out of skulls. Now that's freaky. Langdon scanned the class. Does that sound freaky to anyone else? Yes, they all chimed in. Langdon feigned a sad sigh. Too bad. If that's too freaky for you, then I know you'll never want to join my cult. Silence settled over the room. The student from the women's center looked uneasy. You're in a cult. Langdon nodded and lowered his voice to a conspiratorial whisper. Don't tell anyone, but on the pagan day of the sun god Ra, I kneel at the foot of an ancient instrument of torture and consume ritualistic symbols of blood and flesh. The class looked horrified. Langdon shrugged. And if any of you care to join me, come to the Harvard Chapel on Sunday, kneel beneath the crucifix, and take Holy Communion. The classroom remained silent. Langdon winked. Open your minds, my friends. We all fear what we do not understand. The tolling of a clock began echoing through the Capitol corridors. Seven o'clock. Robert Langdon was now running. Talk about a dramatic entrance. Passing through the house connecting corridor, he spotted the entrance to the National Statuary Hall and headed straight for it. As he neared the door, he slowed to a nonchalant stroll and took several deep breaths. Buttoning his jacket, he lifted his chin ever so slightly and turned the corner just as the final chime sounded. Showtime. As Professor Robert Langdon strode into the National Statuary Hall, he raised his eyes and smiled warmly. An instant later, his smile evaporated. He stopped dead in his tracks. Something was very, very wrong. Chapter 7 Catherine Salomon hurried across the parking lot through the cold rain, wishing she had worn more than jeans and a cashmere sweater. As she neared the building's main entrance, the roar of the giant air purifiers got louder. She barely heard them, her ears still ringing from the phone call she'd just received. That which your brother believes is hidden in DC it can be found. K. 
Catherine found the notion almost impossible to believe. She and the caller still had much to discuss and had agreed to do so later that evening. Reaching the main doors, she felt the same sense of excitement she always felt upon entering the gargantuan building. Nobody knows this place is here. The sign on the door announced. Smithsonian Museum Support Center SMSC The Smithsonian Institution, despite having more than a dozen massive museums on the National Mall, had a collection so huge that only 2% of it could be on display at any one time. The other 98% of the collection had to be stored somewhere. And that somewhere was here. Not surprisingly, this building was home to an astonishingly diverse array of artifacts giant Buddha, handwritten codices, poison darts from New Guinea, jewel encrusted knives, a kayak made of baleen. Equally mind boggling were the building's natural treasures, plesiosaur skeletons, a priceless meteorite collection, a giant squid, even a collection of elephant skulls brought back from an African safari by Teddy Roosevelt. But none of this was why the Smithsonian secretary, Peter Salomon, had introduced his sister to the SMSC three years ago. He had brought her to this place not to behold scientific marvels, but rather to create them. And that was exactly what Catherine had been doing. Deep within this building, in the darkness of the most remote recesses, was a small scientific laboratory unlike any other in the world. The recent breakthroughs Catherine had made here in the field of noetic science had ramifications across every discipline from physics, to history, to philosophy, to religion. Soon everything will change, she thought. As Catherine entered the lobby, the front desk guard quickly stashed his radio and yanked the earplugs from his ears. Miss Salomon. He smiled broadly. Redskins. He blushed, looking guilty. Pregame. She smiled. I won't tell. She walked to the metal detector and emptied her pockets. When she slid the gold Cartier watch from her wrist, she felt the usual pang of sadness. The timepiece had been a gift from her mother for Catherine's 18th birthday. Almost 10 years had now passed since her mother had died violently. Passing away in Catherine's arms. So, Miss Salomon, the guard whispered jokingly. Are you ever gonna tell anybody what you're doing back there? She glanced up. Someday, Kyle. Not tonight. Come on, he pressed. A secret lab. In a secret museum? You must be doing something cool. Miles beyond cool, Catherine thought as she collected her things. The truth was that Catherine was doing science so advanced that it no longer even resembled science. Chapter 8 Robert Langdon stood frozen in the doorway of the National Statuary Hall and studied the startling scene before him. The room was precisely as he remembered it a balanced semicircle built in the style of a Greek amphitheatre. The graceful arched walls of sandstone and Italian plaster were punctuated by columns of variegated breccia, interspersed with the nation's statuary collection life-size statues of 38 great Americans standing in a semicircle on a stark expanse of black and white marble tile. It was exactly as Langdon had recalled from the lecture he had once attended here. Except for one thing. Tonight, the room was empty. No chairs. No audience. No Peter Salomon. Just a handful of tourists milling around aimlessly, oblivious to Langdon's grand entrance. Did Peter mean the rotunda? He peered down the south corridor toward the rotunda and could see tourists milling around in there, too. The echoes of the clock chime had faded. Langdon was now officially late. He hurried back into the hallway and found a docent. Excuse me, the lecture for the Smithsonian event tonight? Where is that being held? The docent hesitated. I'm not sure, sir. When does it start? Now. 
The man shook his head. I don't know about any Smithsonian event this evening not here, at least. Bewildered, Langdon hurried back toward the center of the room, scanning the entire space. Is Solomon playing some kind of joke? Langdon couldn't imagine it. He pulled out his cell phone and the fax page from this morning and dialed Peter's number. His phone took a moment to locate a signal inside the enormous building. Finally, it began to ring. The familiar southern accent answered. Peter Solomon's office, this is Anthony. May I help you? Anthony. Langdon said with relief. I'm glad you're still there. This is Robert Langdon. There seems to be some confusion about the lecture. I'm standing in the statuary hall, but there's nobody here. Has the lecture been moved to a different room? I don't believe so, sir. Let me check. His assistant paused a moment. Did you confirm with Mr. Solomon directly? Langdon was confused. No, I confirmed with you, Anthony. This morning? Yes, I recall that. There was a silence on the line. That was a bit careless of you, don't you think, Professor? Langdon was now fully alert. I beg your pardon. Consider this, the man said. You received a fax asking you to call a number, which you did. You spoke to a total stranger who said he was Peter Solomon's assistant. Then you willingly boarded a private plane to Washington and climbed into a waiting car. Is that right? Langdon felt a chill race through his body. Who the hell is this? Where is Peter? I'm afraid Peter Solomon has no idea you're in Washington today. The man's southern accent disappeared and his voice morphed into a deeper, mellifluous whisper. You are here, Mr. Langdon, because I want you here. Chapter 9 Inside the statuary hall, Robert Langdon clutched his cell phone to his ear and paced in a tight circle. Who the hell are you? The man's reply was a silky calm whisper. Do not be alarmed, Professor. You have been summoned here for a reason. Summoned? Langdon felt like a caged animal. Try kidnapped. Hardly. The man's voice was eerily serene. If I wanted to harm you, you would be dead in your town car right now. He let the words hang for a moment. My intentions are purely noble, I assure you. I would simply like to offer you an invitation. No thanks. Ever since his experiences in Europe over the last several years, Langdon's unwanted celebrity had made him a magnet for nutcases and this one had just crossed a very serious line. Look, I don't know what the hell is going on here, but I'm hanging up unwise, said the man. Your window of opportunity is very small if you want to save Peter Solomon's soul. Langdon drew a sharp breath. What did you say? I'm sure you heard me. The way this man had uttered Peter's name had stopped Langdon cold. What do you know about Peter? At this point, I know his deepest secrets. Mr. Solomon is my guest and I can be a persuasive host. This can't be happening. You don't have Peter. I answered his private cell phone. That should give you pause. I'm calling the police. No need, the man said. The authorities will join you momentarily. What is this lunatic talking about? Langdon stone hardened. If you have Peter, put him on the phone right now. That's impossible. Mr. Solomon is trapped in an unfortunate place. The man paused. He is in the Araf. Where? Langdon realized he was clutching his phone so tightly his fingers were going numb. The Araf? Hamis Tagan? That place to which Dante devoted the canticle immediately following his legendary inferno. 
The man's religious and literary references solidified Langdon's suspicion that he was dealing with a madman. The Second Canticle Langdon knew it well, nobody escaped Philip Sexter Academy without reading Dante. You're saying you think Peter Salomon is? In purgatory, a crude word you Christians use, but yes, Mr. Salomon is in the in-between. The man's words hung in Langdon's ear. Are you saying Peter is dead? Not exactly, no. Not exactly? Langdon yelled, his voice echoing sharply in the hall. A family of tourists looked over at him. He turned away and lowered his voice. Death is usually an all-or-nothing thing. You surprise me, Professor. I expected you to have a better understanding of the mysteries of life and death. There is a world in between a world in which Peter Solomon is hovering at the moment. He can either return to your world or he can move on to the next. Depending on your actions right now. Langdon tried to process this. What do you want from me? It's simple. You have been given access to something quite ancient. And tonight, you will share it with me. I have no idea what you're talking about. No? You pretend not to understand the ancient secrets that have been entrusted to you. Langdon felt a sudden sinking sensation, now guessing what this was probably about. Ancient secrets. He had not uttered a word to anyone about his experiences in Paris several years earlier, but Grail fanatics had followed the media coverage closely, some connecting the dots and believing Langdon was now privy to secret information regarding the Holy Grail perhaps even its location. Look, Langdon said, if this is about the Holy Grail, I can assure you I know nothing more than, don't insult my intelligence, Mr. Langdon, the man snapped. I have no interest in anything so frivolous as the Holy Grail or mankind's pathetic debate over whose version of history is correct. Circular arguments over the semantics of faith hold no interest for me. Those are questions answered only through death. The stark words left Langdon confused. Then what the hell is this about? The man paused for several seconds. As you may know, there exists within this city an ancient portal. An ancient portal? And tonight, Professor, you will unlock it for me. You should be honored I contacted you this is the invitation of your lifetime. You alone have been chosen. And you have lost your mind. I'm sorry, but you've chosen poorly, Langdon said. I don't know anything about any ancient portal. You don't understand, Professor. It was not I who chose you. It was Peter Salomon. What? Langdon replied, his voice barely a whisper. Mr. Salomon told me how to find the portal, and he confessed to me that only one man on earth could unlock it. And he said that man is you. If Peter said that, he was mistaken. Or lying. I think not. He was in a fragile state when he confessed that fact, and I am inclined to believe him. Langdon felt a stab of anger. I'm warning you, if you hurt Peter in any, it's far too late for that, the man said in an amused tone. I've already taken what I need from Peter Salomon. But for his sake, I suggest you provide what I need from you. Time is of the essence. For both of you. I suggest you find the portal and unlock it. Peter will point the way. Peter? I thought you said Peter was in purgatory. As above, so below, the man said. Langdon felt a deepening chill. This strange response was an ancient hermetic adage that proclaimed a belief in the physical connection between heaven and earth. As above, so below. Langdon eyed the vast room and wondered how everything had weird so suddenly out of control tonight. Look, I don't know how to find any ancient portal. I'm calling the police. It really hasn't dawned on you yet, 
has it? Why you were chosen? No, Langdon said. It will, he replied, chuckling. Any moment now. Then the line went dead. Langdon stood rigid for several terrifying moments, trying to process what had just happened. Suddenly, in the distance, he heard an unexpected sound. It was coming from the rotunda. Someone was screaming. Chapter 10 Robert Langdon had entered the Capitol Rotunda many times in his life, but never at a full sprint. As he ran through the north entrance, he spotted a group of tourists clustered in the center of the room. A small boy was screaming, and his parents were trying to console him. Others were crowding around, and several security guards were doing their best to restore order. He pulled it out of his sling, someone said frantically, and just left it there. As Langdon drew nearer, he got his first glimpse of what was causing all the commotion. Admittedly, the object on the Capitol floor was odd, but its presence hardly warranted screaming. The device on the floor was one Langdon had seen many times. The Harvard Art Department had dozens of these life-size plastic models used by sculptors and painters to help them render the human body's most complex feature, which, surprisingly, was not the human face but rather the human hand. Someone left a mannequin hand in the rotunda. Mannequin hands, or handequins as some called them, had articulated fingers enabling an artist to pose the hand in whatever position he wanted which for sophomoric college students was often with the middle finger extended straight up in the air. This handequin, however, had been positioned with its index finger and thumb pointing up toward the ceiling. As Langdon drew nearer, though, he realized this handequin was unusual. Its plastic surface was not smooth like most. Instead, the surface was mottled and slightly wrinkled and appeared almost like real skin. Langdon stopped abruptly. Now he saw the blood. My God! The severed wrist appeared to have been skewered onto a spiked wooden base so that it would stand up. A wave of nausea rushed over him. Langdon inched closer, unable to breathe, seeing now that the tips of the index finger and thumb had been decorated with tiny tattoos. The tattoos, however, were not what held Langdon's attention. His gaze moved instantly to the familiar golden ring on the fourth finger. No. Langdon recoiled. His world began to spin as he realized he was looking at the severed right hand of Peter Solomon.